Father, your presence is surely here. And so now as we open the pages of your holy word, we pray that through your word, from your word, by your word, you'll speak to each one of us. You speak to our situation, our circumstances, our conditions. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to skip uh, most of the preamble to the message. Um, but uh, if you remember, we started last week knowing God's will. And I want to see how far I can get with that today. Um, because we want to continue in that, knowing God's will. And um, um, the passage that we read was from Jeremiah chapter 29, um, verses 4 to 14. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 um, to 14. And if you remember when we started last week, we shared that God has a plan for every area of your life. Do you remember that? And we shared that God, God's will must be desired. So here's a plan for every area of your life. There is nothing insignificant about you. God has a, concern, has a plan, rather. He's concerned about every area of your life, and we share that his will must be desired. He has a dream for you. He has an imagination for your life, a design for what your life ought to be like and how your life ought to be like, but you've got to desire it. You've got to pursue it. You've got to want it. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, if you search for me, if you seek for me with all your heart, you will what? Find me. So if you, if you miss some of that, find it online and watch it and you will get more. But this week we want to continue with number three. This, the third point is only God can reveal his will for you. Only God can reveal his will for you. But, 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 but these things are important. That we're, These guardrails that we are talking about are important. Only God can reveal his will for you. Now, now that, that's a simple statement, but very true. Now, now, as we get into talking about God's will, beloved, there is a level of God's will that is universal. Okay? There is a level of God's will that applies to everyone in the building. There, there are some things that God wants from each one of us. You don't necessarily have to fast and pray to know these things. God wants all of us to worship him. God wants all of us to love our neighbors. That's for everybody. He wants all of us to be kind and compassionate and forgiving. That's his universal will for all. He wants all of us to be good stewards. You remember Paul said uh, to Timothy, it is the will of God that all of creation come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, so it's God's will that everyone find salvation. That's his will for all of us. There are certain aspects of God's will that is universal. Are you with me? But there are certain aspects of God's will that are uniquely crafted for each one of us individually. God has a will for you that is just about you. God has a dream and an imagination for you that takes into account how you are built, that takes into account how you are created, that takes into account what God knows about you. God has a will for your life that takes into account your personality. We don't all have the same personality. Some of us, we process differently. Some of us feel differently. Our logic is different. Our strengths are different. Your strengths are different than my strengths. Your weaknesses are different than my weaknesses. There are some people that hear a loud noise or they see trouble and they run from it. There are some of us we see and we hear of trouble and we run to it. We, we, I don't make you bad, coward. No, no, I'm, no you're just different. And God says, based on my will for you, I take into account who you are. And so, so, so now, I, I'm saying this, beloved, as we're talking about knowing God's will, because I've been in the church long enough to know that there's been some trouble and some confusion that has happened. So we've got to be cautious. We've got to be careful about mimicking what someone else discerned is God's will for their life and try to make it God's will for your life. 
You see, this is important because when we become desperate to know the will of God and we cannot discern it, listen carefully, we become vulnerable to people who seem to have clarity and conviction about what they think God had said to them. And you end up trying to mimic what they are doing and not trying to real and not realizing that's for them, not for you. And so God's will for another person is not God's will for you. Any good parent knows this. You've got at least two kids and you've got to learn each of their identity because they're different and you got to know how to speak to them because they're different. God's will for each of us is unique. God made sure that you have your own fingerprint. And only you have your DNA makeup. Only you have your dental makeup. In the same way, in, in, in that same unique way that God made us, he has a will that is crafted and customized for each one of us. And so let's, we, we, we're looking at the passage. I want you to read it uh, in your spare time. We read it last week, Jeremiah uh, chapter 4. But we, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, I want you to read these passages when you go home. But I promise you it's there in verse 21 and 22. All right? Read it and you'll see what I'm about to say that is true. So we put it in context and Jeremiah is speaking to people who are in exile. And so around verse 21 and 22, um, uh, you find out that before Jeremiah, two other prophets had showed up. Ahab and Zedekiah. Ahab and Zedekiah came with a different message. Remember, only God can reveal your will to you. Are you following? Okay. And so they told the people that it won't be long. You remember, Jeremiah said it'd be 70 years. Ahab and Zedekiah says, oh, it won't be long. In other words, in modern day English, Ahab and, and Zedekiah got behind the pulpit and started saying, ah, the storm is passing over. Abra, Kadabra. You, you won't be here, but for a little while. And the people got excited. Ahab and Zedekiah just shouted a little bit and said, God will deliver you. That's, that's what they did. You, you, you've been to one of those churches. It, and, and, you know, it's about to happen. Spin around six times and on the seventh time, it'll happen. They, they had a different message than Jeremiah. But if you read verse 8 and 9, God said to the people, do not listen to them. They are false prophets. He said they are prophesying lies in my name. Beloved, listen to me. When you are desperate to know the will of God, you become vulnerable to false prophecies. You become vulnerable to people who said the Lord says what the Lord did not say. One of the most dangerous things about false prophets is they don't identify as false prophets. False prophets don't walk in and say, I am a prophet false, but I am a prophet. You see, false prophets don't think that they are false prophets. Listen, I want you to hear me because a lot of us are guilty for this. You listen to all kinds of preachers based on your mood. You just want to get out of your funk. And, 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 oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. It may not be a preacher, but it could be a worship person. It could be a guy who wrote all of his songs in the nude and is proud of it. A real story. And you're singing it. Okay, you know what? We don't have time. I just... <sighs> You're going to be okay. Stump. False prophets don't think that they're prophesying falsely. False prophets are not intentionally trying to manipulate. The problem is that those false prophets, they believe what they're saying. They are convinced and convicted that they are telling the truth. So Ahab and Zedekiah believed that, they were telling the, that what they were telling the people was from God. They may even have had some Bible to back it up. False prophets can be sincere. They may even have the Bible. And God says that what makes them false is not a lack of authenticity, but what, what makes them false is the fact that I did not send them to speak to you. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. What makes them false is may, may not be what they're saying. It's just not for you. 
Somebody may be prophetic, but they're not under assignment to speak to you. I'm saying this. I can give you the 10 steps to find out the will of God, but it's a problem when you're trying to find out the will of God, but you're eating more spiritual food from another man's table. Now, let's be clear about what I'm going to say. I will make sure my passion is under control because I'm not jealous of those folks. I just want to be clear. But, and there are some of you who listen to all kinds of other preachers. Here's the problem. They don't know you. You're a viewer, a number, a name. There is no relational connection. So be careful about all those other preachers that you allow to speak into your life. Be careful about all the other preachers that you take guidance and direction and counsel from. Whether it's a preacher from the pulpit or a book or a podcast or a worship. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, listen, 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 let me be clear. I'm not looking for more work. So don't be like, well, no, we got to call pastor only. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to attack your independence. You own your internet. You pay for it. You watch whatever you want. I'm just trying to do the work of a shepherd and warn you sincerity and conviction does not mean that the person was a, appointed or ordained to speak into your life are you still good just because a person is sincere or because a person has bible passages it doesn't mean what they're saying is for you they may be called reverend doctor apostle prophet reverend doctor apostle prophet evangelist whatever they may be called doesn't mean that they're appointed to speak into your life. Every Christian, post-COVID especially, this is important, as much as it is possible, ought to be under the spiritual authority of spiritual covering. Every Christian ought to be under the covering of a local church. You don't like the one that you're in, find another that you can submit yourself to. It is important. Your soul is important. Don't mess with it. We, we treat Christianity as though we're going through Walmart. I want, I don't want, I don't like, I return. It's like you buy from Amazon, I don't like it. Okay, I'll go just go print the form, send it in, don't want it. That's what I believe the Bible teaches and how it ought to be. Now, I'm not saying that, that we don't impact people through social media. And, and I'm not saying we don't impact people through, through YouTube or all the online stuff. But there's got to be connection with pastoral authority. The people that, mm, Lord Jesus, I appreciate everybody who takes in our service. But after a while, make yourself known. Because we're not interested in just viewership. Does not impress me. I hope you get what I'm saying. So those of you who take us in online, great. But stop being a watcher of Shiloh. Get connected. Tell us your name. Tell us who you are. Tell us your prayer requests. Tell us your joys. Build connection. We're interested in making disciples. But I'm saying to all of us, we've got to, when we try to figure out the will of God, we've got to stop being vulnerable and acting out of desperation to people who say, God told me to tell you. If, if you belong to this church, for example, and, 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 and there are certain things and certain needs that are not being met, let the leadership know. Don't complain. Don't be like, I got to find it from oh, no, Jim Bob online. Tell us, because you may not be alone. Maybe it's a blind spot for us. You'd be amazed. Some of us like to know what's not working. Because you matter. What you don't understand, ask. Don't just go pray that the Lord changes. <laughs> Have you not realized it ain't happening? And, and, can I be a pastor? And maybe somebody might say, Pastor, I do have to leave. There's a way to leave. 
we should do this thing better than the world. Well, you just start sleeping off and off and suddenly we don't hear from you. And then before too long, you're over there. No, be a Christian. Be honest. Pastor, mm -mm. it ain't working. And I'll be like, why? Okay, I promise you, I'll pray over you. We'll release you. So next time, you don't have to feel awkward. I wonder if you're going to be there. Because you know me, I'll show up boldly, especially if I know where you are. <laughs> Sister Natalie here? <laughs> I just couldn't think of another name. Am I making sense? There's a way that Christians ought to live. Why, why, do, why do people think we always have to agree on everything? Yo, it'd be a boring world if we all agreed on everything. Just saying. Are we still good? My, 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 my thing is stop treating your spiritual life as cheap. Stop being naive and vulnerable to people who are hyper-spiritual or to people who have large crowds following them. Then they must be of God. Mm. Or the music is hype and there is smoke. <laughs> By the way, I think is it where there's smoke, there's fire or something like that? Eventually something burns. Stop following people who appear to be extremely anointed. Stop sowing seeds in all these people's lives because you believe what they told you that they have a word for you. By the way, they have the same word for another hundred people. Sow seeds in areas where that seed can be watched over, nurtured, cared for, and protected from weeds. Some people sow seeds in another man's garden. This is a real problem. You sow a seed in another man's garden and come to this church and expect to reap a harvest here. We don't grow that kind of crops here. <laughs> so if you want cucumbers, mm, you can pray all you want. We produce grapes, sweetie. I, 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 this is, am I making sense? And, and this is important. And so people become dissatisfied because you, you fed yourself. All, we never fed these kinds of extreme charismatic craziness. Why are you expecting the spirit to move in that crazy way? Oh, okay, you see you're getting uncomfortable. <laughs> and sometimes you wonder why things are not working out for you. I hope you're hearing my heart. I'm a pastor. I was called to do it. And that means that my, my primary Priority is soul care. And I want Christians to stop being dependent and naive and vulnerable to other people in order to know God's will for their lives. Let me tell you a little something. Stop making some preachers feel, please, don't take this the wrong way. Stop making some people feel that they're more important than they ought to feel. God never created you to be dependent on some person to know his will and his plan for your life. When I speak to you about God's will and God's plan for your life, it ought to be a validation or a confirmation of what God is saying. Now, it's possible that I might say something that might provoke you. That might be an invitation for you to pursue us, God and he'll ultimately reveal it to you. But you've got to sense it in your spirit. And the problem is that some of us do not take uh, responsibility for the outcome of our Christian life. You put it on the church. You put it on the pastor. The, the children of Israel could not go to God directly. So they needed prophets and priests to intercede and to tell them what the Lord wanted. When, when Saul did not know if he should go into battle, he went to Samuel to inquire about the will of the Lord. And, and you know, can, can I say a little something? Not every preacher takes this seriously. Sister Lindsay, imagine what it was like to be a priest back then. When you went into the holies of holies, they tied a bunch of stuff around you with, a, with bells. Some, some preachers carelessly handle the Lord's people and the Lord's business. And, and the idea was that you went into intercede for the people. And if you're not right before the Lord and they don't hear those bells moving, they're going to pull your dead body out. Because God will smite you and God pull you out. But thank God for Jesus. The Bible says he became our great high priest. He died on that cross. 
And when he died on that cross, the Bible says the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And we gain access directly to God so we can know his will. We can know his plans for our lives just like the priest could. So just let me be clear for the very independent people. I'm coming for you. I'm not saying you don't need a preacher. You do need a preacher to show you the way, to guide you, to show you how to discern or to confirm God's will for your life. By the way, for some folks, listen, some of you that mess with this foolishness, you don't need a sidekick either. You don't need your palms read. You don't need horoscope. Oh, what month were you born? What does that have to do with anything? The right month. Well, I mean, you know, we all know there's a better month, but, but the right month. I mean, of course, April is just. But not everybody, you know. <laughs> you, you, you can go to God yourself. God uses people to confirm his will, not reveal it. Confirmation is not revelation. Sh should I get married? I don't know. Should you? Is that the right person? I don't know. Is he? You get what I'm saying? Listen, your presence in this church is not revealing to me that God called me to the pastorate. You know, some people build churches like that. Well, you want me to preach, so then I'll become a pastor. Whoa. Your presence in this church confirms that God calls me to do this. Because if God used you to reveal to me by your attendance and your support what his will is for me as the pastor, I'll become dependent on you. And guess what? When you're not happy, I can't sleep. When you're upset, your peace, your happiness would be all that matters to me. No, if you're not happy, as long as I'm not responsible. I, I yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, so yes, we ought to be grateful for, for people who confirm God's will in our lives. But be careful because what happens if that person leaves? What happens if they die? Oh, oh, what happens if they backslide? The, the problem, Brother Penny, is that we don't want to put the work in. We don't want to maintain fellowship with God. We don't want to read the Bible daily. We don't want to pray daily. You don't want to worship. We don't want to live holy. But he says, if you seek me, you will find me. He didn't say, if you seek me, I'll give pastor a word for you. If you seek me, I'll give your mommy a word for you. If you seek me, what your boss says is my, is my word for you. He tells them, ignore Ahab and Zedekiah. They are telling you what they're... Listen carefully. Don't miss this. Ahab, and this is where a lot of us get into trouble. Ahab and Zedekiah were telling them about their right now. Jeremiah was telling them about their then. Have you noticed that most preachers tell you about your now? Rarely about your then? But they're supposed to be prophetic. You should be like, I know my now. <laughs> the, 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 the best way to discern what you don't know about God's will is to obey what you do know about God's will. The best way to discern what you don't know about God's will is to obey what you do know about God's will. God, should I get married? Until he tells you, live godly now. When, you, when you're trying to discern God's will, obey what you do know about God's will. And it's possible that you cannot discern God's will for your tomorrow because you are disobedient in your today. You want to know if there's a promotion in store for you? You don't even tithe from the job you have now. But you're asking God about the future. You don't even spend time with God now when you're asking God. You should be like, I hope I make it to the future. Let me, let me give you, the, let me give you the, the, fourth, the fourth point, and we'll try to wrap this up. We're still good? We'll try to wrap this up. And, and, and this is crucial. Again, I will give you some tips in a couple of weeks on how to figure it out. But these things are crucial because you're going to need to know the will of God now, and there are other situations that will arise. Let me give you number four. God's will 
is not always easy. God's will is not always easy. Sister Nandi, let that settle for a bit. God's will is not always easy. Because too often we have confused the will of God with the path of least resistance. Again, you're in a suffering season and you find a good preacher who tells you, clap your hands over your head, give an offering. And then tomorrow morning you'll wake up in joy. Well, if you've ever done it, you know. Six weeks later, joy still didn't come. And, and, and too often, beloved, we, we assume, and, and why am I saying this? I'm not trying to attack. This, this is a real thing. I've been in this pastorate for 10 years. This is not an attack. I know my people, and some, some of the Lord has put it on my heart. These are some of the weeds that are in your life that's preventing you from flourishing. Because you either come from churches or have mindsets that we're trying to affect. And, and, and too often we assume that if there are obstacles, that could never be God. If there are struggles, oh, no, no, no. That is not the Lord, the blood. If there are challenges, no, no, no. That's not God's will. Listen, beloved, God's will is not always the easiest option. Can I tell you something when he said, take up your cross and follow me. There is a price to pay. So why is it that we always want to walk around with no cross? And some of us came into, and that's why, you know, I do altar calls. I, I invite people to Jesus, but I don't sell Christian insurance. I'm not that kind of salesman. I sell salvation, but I'm telling you the real cost. Your life must change. Your thinking must change. It might cost you everything. Now you want it? And so what happens is people are not told the real deal and then end up being disappointed. God's will, listen to me carefully. I want you to hear me what I'm saying. Following God's will requires obstacles. I'm human. Christian, but human. So if there are not some obstacles, uh, I, Pastor Joel, will pray less. Not you. You always pray. Good day, bad day, you always pray. Nope. Not me. Good days, yeah, we pray. Bad days, we pray, pray, pray. You get what I'm saying? God knows my human nature. I hope it's the same for you. Because if that's not you, well, <clears throat> you've been taking something. God's will requires obstacles. God's will includes opposition. God's will includes having doubts. Hello. And doubters. I'm believing the Lord for a business. What, you? God's will does have criticism. God's will will lead you into difficult seasons in your life. God's will is not always easy. Can we go to the Bible to support it? He tells the children of Israel, I will put you in Babylon. Huh? Okay, you got to read the Bible. Really read it. I, God, will put you in Babylon. It is my plan for you to be in Babylon. I allowed you to be carried there. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I said you heard what I said. I don't like it. But you want me to be there, God? Yes. It doesn't feel good, God. Uh-huh. But that's, that's where I, I have you. It hurts, God. Mm, that's where. God, it's unfair. That's where I have you. It's my will. Sometimes, beloved, we end up in difficult spaces and situations and circumstances because of the consequences of our sins. 
Sin still has consequences. The power of sin is broken at the cross, but the consequences in everyday life still remains. You get pregnant out of wedlock, or you get pregnant, and there are consequences. Okay, wow, some stuff makes you uncomfortable. But we try to get redos instead of letting God redeem the thing. You get married when you shouldn't have? Okay, you know what? Here's what I'm saying. There are times that not just because of our sinning, there are some consequences that are hard, but there are times that based on where God wants to take us and what he wants to do in us and through us, that he allows difficulties and trouble to come. The, the, the will of God will cause you to experience what you would rather avoid. Sometimes pursuing the will of God will cause you to face and deal with things that you never thought you'd have to deal with. Storms are sometimes part of God's plan. Sometimes sicknesses and the diagnosis that you hate and don't want is part of God's plan. Sometimes the will of God takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes being the will of God means you go to a funeral. Babylon became a part of his plan. Let's think about the Bible. When they were, he says, while you were, he says to them, while you're in Babylon, pray for the Babylonians. I, I beg your pardon. He says, while you are there, now, now if you remember in Psalm 137, the Babylonians asked them to sing praises to God. And they thought that was hard. How can we? And, and, and that's what they said. And, but but, but it, it had to have been harder when God says, pray for the Babylonians. The will of God will often require you to do what is not easy. The will of God will require you to make sacrifices you don't want to make. The will of God will cause you to end and walk away from relationships that you'd rather stay in. The will of God will cause you to stay in a place where you are unknown when it's your desire to be famous. The will of God will cause you to take a job that pays less when you could have had something that paid more. He left them in Babylon for 70 years. Listen, beloved, seven years is a long time. For some, that's a lifetime. The will of God, they, they have to have been there for 70 years. Sometimes the will of God is not instant, is not immediate. Sometimes the will of God does not manifest itself after the amen. Sometimes the will of God requires that we endure some things and we are patient through some things and we go through some, we sit through some seasons, Dawkins, and we walk through some things. God's will is not always easy. They were there for 70 years. Can I tell you something? 70 is a multiple of seven, which is a number of completion. When you see seven, it means that God is doing something. God is at work. And he had them there for 70 years because there was something he was doing in them that needed to be finished. He was changing them. This is the part of the sermon where I need you to be fully alert because we're closing it. And I'm closing it quick and I'm not getting in depth. So I'm summarizing the close. Are you with me? So pay full attention because he had them there for 70 years because he was trying to finish something in them. He was trying to change them. He planned to take them back to Jerusalem, but he could not take them to Jerusalem the way they were. So he puts them through an experience that they don't want to go through. He has them do something that they don't want to do. He has them endure something that they'd rather get out of. Is anybody with me? I want you to look at your own life. You've been wanting to come out. 
And God's like, I, I want you out. By the way, can I say something? Some of you have, you're overstaying the time God really intended for you to stay, by the way. That's a word from the Lord. Because of your disobedience and your stubbornness and your pridefulness. But he puts them through an experience based on where it is that they're going so that they can be changed and prepared for what he has for them. Because the will of God is not just about what God wants, to, wants you to do or what God wants to do for you. But the will of God is also about who God wants you to be. The will of God is not just about where God is taking you, but it's about what God is making of you. The will of God is not just about a decision, but it is about your development as a child of God. And easy doesn't change us. Easy doesn't cause us to reflect over our lives and seek God. Easy doesn't make us want to get in the word and get to prayer and improve our worship. Easy does not make you want to do what you've got to do in order to get what God has for you. Because a big part of God's will is something that changes us. God wants you to take the job. Not only that will change the balance of your bank account, but the job that will change you. And sometimes the job that will change you won't change the balance of your bank account. God wants you to marry the person that will bring about change in you. Not just in your status. God wants you to be part of a church. Or have friends in your life that brings about a better you. Not an easier life. Remember in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter talks about an adversary, the enemy who walks around like a roaring lion. What does he do? Seeking whom he may devour. But if you continue reading, here's what he says. But after you've suffered a while, the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan does his best. But after you've suffered for a little while, what he will do? He will strengthen you. After you've suffered for a little while, he will perfect you. He will establish you. After you've been through the worst, God will get you ready for the best. After you've endured and after the broken heart, God reveals his best. God will often allow what is not easy to prepare you for what is evil. I should say that again. God sometimes allow what is not easy to prepare you for what is evil. Because God knows the plans that Satan has concerning you. And that's evil. But he allows you to go through some stuff to prepare you for the evil that is to come. Some of you, the only reason why you're able to survive some things now is because of what you've been through. It prepared you for what is to come. I'm not glorifying this, but because of a parental abandonment, you're able to stand now when you are left. God knows what the enemy has in store. And he will allow you to go to Babylon to change you so that you are ready for what's coming your way. Some of you, you've had accidents because God wanted you to know, I got you. You can trust me. So yes, what you've been through was not easy. But thank God that he brought you through and he allowed it to prepare you for what you're facing now. So beloved, no one can reveal God's will for your life. And God's will is not easy. That's what I'm telling you today. You know, humanity, in case you haven't figured it out, is different from all other creation because of our free will. The sun does not have a will. Rises in the east sets in the west imagine the sun saying nope i'm reversing the order i mean you know there's even climate change and here we're not even gonna go there we, we're gonna stay we're gonna stay plants don't have a will they blossom in the spring they die in the fall animals don't have a will they have instinct no matter how much you love them human beings have free will and that's what makes it tricky because though God has a will for each one of us, he never forces his will 
on us. And so because we have free will, we can either choose God's will or not. And so beloved, God has a perfect will. And we can choose to be in his perfect will. Or you can choose to make some decision that puts you in God's permissive will. I told you I'm summarizing. And so, so when you're in God's per permissive will, it's not his perfect will, but it's what God allows without too many consequences. But some of us are hard-headed and stubborn and we end up in God's prohibited will. And that's where you know it's wrong. You know you shouldn't. You know that contradicts God's plans, what he's telling you to do. But thank God that mercy covers you. God says go left. Huh. You go right because you just, well, that's just me. Nobody tells me what to do. But mercy covers you because you find yourself in the prohibited will of God. Here's the problem. Mercy covering you means that you're often anxious and troubled and bothered. Not always joyful and peaceful. But there are some of us who you would think that the prohibited will would get our attention. No, 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 no. Some people says, God, I don't want your perfect will. I don't want your permissive will. I don't want your prohibited will. And some says, I'm going for the punitive will. That's because of our free will. And we land in what is called God's punitive will. That's the, the punitive will of God is when we have strayed so far from God's will that he leaves us to our own devices. It's where there is no fear of God in your life. The Bible calls it a reprobate mind. At least that's what the King James says. That means you're disobedient, you're disrespectful, you're nonchalant. That's when God looks at you and says, do you, boo. No, I was do your own thing. And that's where the children of Israel were. They were in the punitive will of God. I, I want, listen, beloved, I'm speaking to people right now in this building under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you are in the punitive will of God. You've been fighting away the consequences, but you know you are in the punitive will and the prohibited will of God. And you expected God to change your situation. God's like, I got to change your will. God, fix my money. No, I want your mind. God, fix the marriage. No, I, want my, I want your mind. God, I want to be married. I want your mind. I just want better. God's like, me too, but I want your mind. They get to Babylon because they violated God's laws. They got to Babylon because they killed the prophets. God sent them to give them warnings. They're in Babylon because they blasphemed the name of God. They're in Babylon because they're chasing after idol gods. They're in Babylon because of their choices. Listen, you could be in church and in exile. You can be in church and out of God's will. Can I say you could be in the pulpit and out of God's will? To show you how serious this is. But here's the good news, beloved. No matter how far we have strayed from God's will, God always have a way of bringing us back. You may have felt like you missed God's plans, but God's will has a way when you surrender to him. To, he had, he, his will and his desire is for you to you may find yourself in his permissive will, prohibited will, punitive will. You can come back to his perfect will. Let me tell you a story. Believe it or not, sometimes I get bored. Oh, you're not shocked? Wow. Sometimes I get tired. Here's the problem. Sometimes I get tired and bored. And that's when it's bad. Because a bored, tired me results in a mischievous me. Well, not too long ago, I was in one of those moods. Left church, decided to head home. And I had a trip earlier that day, so I used the navigation device. And so it was still on. And for whatever reason, bored, tired, I thought, yeah, let's have some fun with the navigation device. 
So I entered the address for my house. I got to Queen Mary, and she said, turn right. You, I mean, I'm bored and mischievous. Turn right. You ain't going to tell me what to do. I went straight. <laughs> got to Donald, turn right. No. Mute. Go straight. Ended up all the way on Montreal Road. Turn right. No. Left. Eventually, I ended up on Rideau. Well, it's not a good idea to get to Rideau between 3.30 apparently and 6 in the daytime. <laughs> Couldn't get past King Edward for a really long time. Thought, oh, I'm just going to cut the corner here. Go down to Aluzi. And about almost an hour later, what would have taken me about eight to nine minutes, I ended up home. But of course, God has a way of delivering even the preacher. And he gave me a message out of it for you. That, but because here's what I'm saying. Every time I disobeyed the instruction and I went in another direction, the navigation system did not give up on the final destination. Every time I took a wrong turn, she recalculated, well, she or it, whatever it is. Every time I took a wrong turn, recalculated, recalculated. I hope you're getting my point. God wants us in his perfect will, and he has a plan to bring us back. Where God wants to take you, beloved, has not changed. The question is, do you still want to go there? And if you've ever strayed from God's will, today is a good day to say, God, I'm coming back home. You see, you see, that's the story of humankind, though. Every time we come to the Lord's table, the preamble that you're like, what are they saying? That's what we're saying in different words. That man fell away from God, but he sends Jesus to restore us to him. Listen to it carefully next time. Because humankind have always chosen everything else but God. But thank God that through the person of Jesus Christ, he finds a way to bring us back to himself. Let's stand. Let me tell you something. Not only did he restore them back to Jerusalem, but you know what the Bible says? He restored everything that they lost. Do you remember he told them, build houses, marry in Babylon? And even in Jerusalem, they got restored what they lost, what they've lost. I'm saying to you, beloved, it's a win-win. When you choose to genuinely surrender to the will of God. He knows how to redeem time and years and everything you thought you missed out on. It reminds me of the words of the hymn that said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply, you know it, stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, what did he do? Hear my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now safe am I. There's a whole lot of stuff we want to share with you, but, but I hope you hear what I believe the Lord is saying to us. We are in this season, beloved, and I believe the Lord is saying, come back to me. Come back to my perfect will for your life. Father, I pray that you would accomplish the purposes of your word in the lives of your people. Father, I pray that we would be responsive 
and responsible to what you are saying. We recognize, Lord, that you have a plan for each area of our lives. Your will must be desired. Only you can reveal your will to us. And your will is not easy. But, Lord, yet I pray that we would all say, not my will, but yours be done. So now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And that peace, beloved, from God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his son Jesus Christ who is our Lord. And as you depart from this place, go forth knowing that you are blessed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I was sinking deep in sin. Gosh, I